in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen my dear sisters and brothers in jesus the redeemer today good friday we actively remember the life and the death of jesus through the way of the cross and as we do so we bring into our prayer our own journey of the cross the cross in our lives in luke chapter 9 verse 23 jesus says if you wish to be my disciple take up your cross each day and follow me it's our cross not his that he invites us to take up and so we do so with the understanding that more than we walking with jesus jesus walks with us on the way of the cross and our theme i've taken this morning is the way of the cross the way of hope and to set this theme in context let me explain in some films the opening scene portrays for us what the final scene of the film is going to be and in showing us the final scene the film director wants us to view the entire film in a particular light from the very start of the film in knowing the end he wants to influence the way that we see and respond to that film the way of the cross can be seen as the way of hope only against the backdrop of what came after the cross the bursting forth from the tomb in the resurrection so suffering and death do not have the last word so as we journey the way of the cross today we do so in the sure knowledge and hope of the resurrection in the light of easter now we may not always be able to change a situation or another person's behavior but we can always choose to look differently at a situation interpret reality in another way and that can make a difference and that is possible only when we dare to hope so we will look at the cross in our life and in that of society today and we look it through it through the eyes of faith and of hope for good friday is followed by easter sunday let this journey of the cross be an experience of the heart we are not here as mere observers or passive spectators this is not an exercise of a pious devotion remembering what happened 2000 years ago rather it is an invitation from jesus to dare to walk the way of the cross as he himself did and the characters that we come across in these different stations will speak to us in many ways so i urge you to enter into this experience asking as i stand around the cross which one is me i invite you to listen not just with your ears but with your hearts to pray not just with your lips but also in your spirit in the deepest core of your being let your whole self your mind heart body and spirit all enter into this experience and then we will have touched the cross the cross of jesus or more importantly we will allow the cross to touch us with hope and with that grace that redeems us and so with this introduction let us now enter into the stations that we are soon going to unfold as a way of explanation i am going to take the traditional stations of the cross but with a difference i will group some of these stations together so that we will reflect on it a little more extensively and profoundly and so with that we begin the first and the second stations jesus is condemned to death and jesus receives the cross we adore thee o christ and we bless thee because Be by your holy cross you have redeemed the world i read to you from john chapter 19 verses 14b to 16 pilate said to the jews behold your king they cried out away with him away with him crucify him pilate said to them shall i crucify your king the chief priest answered we have no king but caesar then he handed him over to them to be crucified jesus was captured at night taken away by the soldiers interrogated tortured and so he was 
led to the court of Pilate, ready to be condemned. Many got together, planned together to get rid of Jesus. The chief priests and the religious leaders, they were challenged by Jesus and want to get rid of him. Pilate, representing the political class and the political leaders, ignored his conscience and denied the very truth standing before him. He prized his popularity. And there were many in the crowds who once perhaps were healed by Jesus, but now scream for his blood. And the sentence is passed on Jesus. It's unfair. Why does a good man have to suffer? Why the cross? Why this unjust condemnation to death? And so we reflect. Today there is so much of suffering. Some of it is personal. and Sometimes the whole groups suffer in society. They are condemned. They bear the cross. What role do you and I have to play? Sometimes people suffer because of discrimination of various kinds. Of language, of religion, of region, of caste, of gender. People with privilege and position play this evil game of discrimination with prejudice, condemning or ill-treating others. Some of us impose the cross on the lives of others as modern-day pilots or high priests. Is it me? Is it us? Further, looking at our personal lives, what is the suffering that we personally undergo? Perhaps we can name it and identify it. The death of a loved one. Or we have been diagnosed with a serious illness. The loss of a job. Your love has been betrayed. The struggles of old age. And you weep silent tears. Some burdens are obvious, but some are so hard to hide. It seems so painful, wrong and evil. So unjust. Why must this happen to me? Why should I suffer so? How do we understand this reality today? Persons being condemned and suffering under the weight of the cross. There are no easy answers. But we can draw strength and courage from the person of Jesus who embraced that painful cross. I don't believe in a God who sends suffering no matter how good or how noble the reason. That he permits and allows suffering, yes. But that he causes and sends suffering, never. The God I believe in is not a cruel sadist or a revengeful tyrant whom we must placate and satisfy so that he will not send suffering our way. God has given us that great gift of freedom and God respects that freedom whether we abuse it badly to sin and cause suffering. That is why God is so pained at sin, at suffering and the hurt it brings. The cruelty, the hatred, the oppression, the injustice, the revenge. No, God doesn't send suffering. Rather, God enters the struggle and against death and suffering and he showed on whose side God stands. We have a God who is scandalously merciful, shamelessly forgiving, generously loving, but also prophetically challenging the evil and the harm that is being done in the world. And this is this God who journeys with us in our suffering as a balm to our souls, the healer of our wounds and the strength for our spirits. God cannot bear injustice and suffering. That's why in Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, God tells Moses, I have seen the affliction of my people. I have heard their cry. I know their suffering. Therefore, I have come down to rescue them. And therefore, God sent Moses. He sent all the other messengers, the prophets. And finally, God sent his only son, Jesus, who took on flesh and experienced the effects of sin and therefore suffering. As we sit here experiencing pain or suffering or sense of abandonment, we may be tempted to cry out, does God know what I'm going through? Does God really know? Yes, God knows it now in Christ Jesus, through his suffering and through his cross. Jesus comes with us with a message of hope for all those who experience a sense of pain, of abandonment, of being forsaken. You know, Many philosophies, many religions portray their founders very triumphantly in power. 
Not so in a Catholic church because where we see a crucifix, the image of a God broken on a cross, a God who's taken on human skin, flesh and bones, who walked the way of the cross. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, we are told we do not have, for we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us in our weaknesses, but one who in every sense has been tempted like us, yet without sin. So in such a situation of tragedy and suffering, to ask, why is God doing this to me? How can God this to me? Perhaps is a misplaced question. We need to get over the questions that focus on the past and just the pain. Why did this happen to me? Rather, we need to ask the questions which open the door to the future. Now that this happened to me, what shall I do about it? What is God calling me to do? God is calling us to see your cross, your suffering in a new perspective, in a new light and a new understanding. If you are to be profit by it and not to be cursed with it. If you are to draw closer to him and not to be bitter against him. If you are to experience new life and grace, not darkness and despair. So today, for the sin in my life and yours that burdens others, we need to repent, to ask forgiveness from God and for others because through this action, we have imposed the cross on other people. On the other hand, the suffering that I and you bear, that the cross we carry, we surrender it to Jesus. To run away from the cross is to run away from Jesus and from the power of the resurrection. Jesus says to us, come to me all who are burdened and I will give you rest. St. Alphonsus, the founder of the Redemptor says, the cross is easier when you embrace it rather than when you drag it. For truly we must say that when we embrace the cross, we embrace Jesus on the cross, the one who carries our burdens, who allows us to transform this way of the cross into the way of hope. And so we pray. Lord, the suffering, the cross disturbs me oppresses me. I even find it hard to understand why you allow it. Why, Lord? Why this sudden death in a family? The starving millions who live in hunger? Bonded laborers, domestic workers, struggling migrants? Why, Lord, I don't understand. Why this suffering in the world that shocks and shatters? Suffering frightens me. Why these people, Lord, and not others? Why these? And sometimes, why me? And God says to us, My child, it is not I, your God, who have willed suffering. It is men and women. They have brought it into the world in bringing sin. Because sin is a disorder, and disorder hurts. There is for every sin somewhere in the world and in time, a corresponding suffering. And the more sins there are, the more suffering there is. But I, says the Lord, came and took all your suffering on me as I took all your sins. I took them and suffered them before you. I transformed them. I made them a treasure. They are still an evil. But through them, I accomplish redemption. I redeem you. And the way of the cross becomes a way of hope, a way of new life. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. May the faithful departed in the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. We now take the second set of stations, and that is the third, the seventh, and the ninth stations. Jesus falls for the first, the second, and the third time. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. I read to you from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 8 to 9a. Three times I besought the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Jesus has been scourged. The cross has been laid upon him. So many have abandoned him. 
And as Jesus grows weaker and weaker, the cross appears heavier and heavier. And therefore he falls again and again and again. But Jesus does not lie on the ground in self-pity. He rose again. He picks up the cross and he moves forward. Being faithful does not mean you do not fall. Being faithful means you pick yourself again after following and start on the road again, on the road chosen. It's an example and a call for us. Like Jesus, we also get up, pick up our crosses and keep going onward, keep going forward. We look at the cross in our lives. People are overburdened by the crosses they carry. They struggle and they sometimes fall. We all have many falls. And sometimes we feel ashamed. We live in denial of the weaknesses and sins. We are not perfect parents, nor perfect spouses. We are not spotless holy priests or religious as we would wish to be. Sometimes we feel crushed by the weight of our own inadequacies, the cross which we are unable to step forward or to go forward. Sometimes some look for relief in addictions, distractions and even escapist behavior. God looks gently on us and invites us to rise again and to begin anew. In Jesus we find our hope and encouragement. And so the three falls of Jesus remind us that even in our complete helplessness, our own Calvary, we need to stand up again. And Jesus is with us each time that we fall and he chooses to love and save us. And that is why God welcomes us repeatedly in the sacrament of confession, the sacrament of reconciliation. But for that, we must first acknowledge our brokenness and the sin in our lives. As we reflect, society has no room for failures. It has no time for them. We are told we are born to win. However, for all those who fail and fall, Jesus comes with a message of hope. It is to thus these people that Jesus addresses the word of redemption. Now, as we look at some of the faults in our lives, some faults are due to addictions. Others are because of our sin or the effects of sin. The addiction could be varied. It could be addiction to alcohol, to drugs, to gambling, to pornography, to social media, to screen games. You can name it. Anything that absorbs our time and energy that takes us from our primary responsibility can be very destructive, not only to ourselves, but to our families. And this is a repeated scenario in many homes and families today. And only when you acknowledge that you are powerless, as the Alcoholics Anonymous 12 Steps puts it so powerfully, it's only when you acknowledge that weakness, that brokenness, can grace break forth, can grace break through. And that will mark a new beginning. Others who fall and fail, but instead of accepting their fallen state of sinfulness, they blame others and justify their actions. They will say, I don't have a problem. And so they make life difficult for those who live with them. As long as we blame other persons and circumstances, then we believe that we don't need to change. The other person has to change. Let us look at our own lives today. Where do we stand? How do we face life? Are we stuck in a rut, blaming the past, giving in to self-pity? Do we choose convenient scapegoats whom we can blame for our own failings and mis misgivings? Just listen to the conversation that we constantly are speaking about. Do you wives find yourself blaming your husbands and husbands your wives? Perhaps we have some blame or grudge that we harbor against our parents or against our brothers or sisters and we constantly throw it at their face. Do we find ourselves saying, it is because of him, because because of her that I am not able to, whatever. If only he had not done this to me, if only she never said that to me. This is the dialogue that we hear constantly. And how much longer are we going to blame someone or something for the past? 
and when we do so we refuse to take responsibility for our lives in the present the time to blame others for every harm must stop when they have done harm we must acknowledge the reality we cannot deny it but having done so we need to accept responsibility as to now what are we going to do with our life there are so many other faults caused by sin or the effects of sin we might call it today a loss of a sense of sin a loss of an acknowledgement of sin and some make light of sin or even just neglect or ignore the sacrament of confession some have not gone for it for months or even years but the effects of sin are serious and cannot be wished away do we flirt with occasions of sin then we have no one else to blame but ourselves because when we go down the slippery slope of sin it becomes part of our life it could be revenge lust hatred pride gossip we need to name the sin that causes harm to us that makes us fall and makes other people fall as well because if we do not accept our weakness then there is hardness of heart and any sin that is repeated becomes a sinful habit and when the sinful habit is repeated it becomes a sinful attitude and when it is a sinful attitude it leads to the hardness of heart where we feel nothing about the wrong and the harm and the evil we do to others we stay fallen 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 god speaks to us today god invites us to repent to rise from our faults as we have those beautiful words if today you listen to his voice harden not your hearts and allow god to transform your faults into moments of redemptive grace the next time that you fall know that it is not the end of the road society may sometimes say so but not a god who understands you and yet challenges you to be the best self you are called to be god calls you and me to be transformed creatures and he gives us the possibility which is our hope now we have reasons to hope when we fall and very quickly i like to lead you to some of these points first of all let us understand what hope is not hope is not just a passive virtue just a weak desire wishful thinking oh i hope it will happen i hope you will come no secondly hope is not just mere optimism optimism as i understand it is i can work things out in my mind in my vision and hope for a better outcome but optimism might take you far it does not take you far enough true hope is much more than optimism because it is rooted in the person of jesus optimism is not necessarily so so hope is more than just a sum of our human effort a striving of the will hope re- offers us resources that come from beyond us hope is knowing that god will make a way then there seems to be no way now one might think that the opposite of hope is despair and despair is easily enough identifiable but what i consider just as dangerous is cynicism because cynicism is an attitude that eats away at a person's willingness to hope it is a way of eating into a own person's way of trusting in himself or herself and more than trusting in god itself it is this attitude that comes to robbers of our christian hope especially when we fail or fall it is this cynicism that tells us it will be a failure it's no use we've tried it again just give up Have you ever heard these words or worse still have you uttered these words to others if so enough of it because we need to know that hope is rooted in the person of Jesus let us pray God says my friend have you fallen or failed are you in despair Just know one thing I love you and my love will raise you up You are precious to me and I cannot let you down Does anyone despise you given up on you Lift up your head gaze into the love in my eyes and renew your strength 
Rise up in hope and see there is light. There is a new and beautiful life in store of you. Lord, we pray that when our strength fails, when our hope fades, when our spirit grows weary, that we will put our unbounded trust and hope in you. Jesus, lift me to my feet when I feel that I can go no further. After so many falls, let me not lose hope. For you are truly a God of new beginnings. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. May the faithful departed in the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. We now come to the fourth station. Jesus meets his mother. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. I read to you from the Gospel according to Luke chapter 2 verses 34 and 35. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is spoken against. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that thoughts out of the many hearts may be revealed. Why is old Simeon said these words to Mary? At that time, she did not know what it meant. But now she does. Mary has just managed to break through the crowd and come face to face with Jesus, whom she sees bleeding and struggling. When Jesus and Mary meet, they just look at each other because words cannot express how they feel. When our loved ones suffer, we feel the pain ourselves and Jesus and Mary must have felt it both within each other. Mary had held Jesus right from the time of his birth in his arms as a refugee fleeing into Egypt. And now she hears the crowds hurling filthy abuses at her son. But Mary will not waver. She will stay faithful to the end, even to the end at the cross and as he's laid in the tomb. What about our lives today? We see Mary's pain in the parents who watch their children involved in painful behavior, drugs, addictions, losing their way, suicide. We see Mary's pain in the child coping with the breakdown of a parent's marriage or struggling with a lack of house or finance. We see this pain in the women and men who suffer violence and the ongoing threat of violence inside the home and outside. All this scandalous suffering is embraced by God when Jesus and his mother meet on this way of the cross. Even though Mary is clear about God's purpose, still the death of her son, soon to be, is a loss she must bear. Mary's response to suffering is a great lesson for us. Often enough, we are called in life with unpleasant and painful things, things that must be faced because we cannot change the reality and things that we must be faced to help us grow. Hopes that are smashed, dreams that are shattered. We need the courage that possessed Mary. We need that courage born of faith to be able to look at life and not turn away. Let us remember that Jesus has given us Mary, his mother, an icon of faith as the gift for our journey. Mary was at the cross. Can you imagine what went through her heart? Every blow of the hammer. In a way, the cross of Jesus was also the cross of Mary. Her son was dying and she could not help. His wounds were bleeding and she could not wipe them away. His mouth was parched but she couldn't place some water on it. The nails held him to the cross and bound him. Mary suffered with Jesus. Mary stood at the foot of the cross experiencing full the words of the prophecy of Simeon that we heard in the gospel. Is there anyone here feeling crushed under the weight and the load of suffering? 
allow Mary to burst into your lives. Mary knows what it feels like. She has experienced it and she can understand and therefore care for us. And Jesus knew that we would need a mother's love. Yes, Mary is Jesus' gift to us, a mother who understands us and cares for us. In a world that is losing its heart, its concern, which doesn't have time, Mary is a symbol of hope and of life. But why do we hope? Why must we hope? Mary always accompanied Jesus from the time in his womb, through his ministry, and now at the hour of his death. Here, as Jesus suffers and walks to his death, his pain is her pain. She, all she can do is stand beside him, just as she will stand at the foot of the cross. She seems to do nothing, but yet she does everything because she stands by him. Such is the solidarity of her presence. In all his pain, she is this perpetual help. The presence of Mary during the way of the cross tells us two things. First of all, she is always there when people suffer. She is perpetual help. Secondly, as her children, we are called to be there for others who suffer, who are marginalized and who need support and strength. I often think that one of the most painful days for Mary was Holy Saturday. She has known the pain of the cross. She knows what darkness means. She felt the emptiness of Good Friday when her son died. Yet, she continued to believe. She continued to have faith. And Holy Saturday was an expression of it. And that is why we call her Virgin Most Faithful, Virgin of Hope, Virgin of Perpetual Help. And Mary comes to you and me today with the message of hope. And as Mary supported Jesus on the way of the cross, the way to Calvary, she continues to support us in the struggles of life so that like her son, we too may experience the cross as a way of life, as a way of hope and a way of redemption. And so we pray. Jesus says to us, My beloved disciples, before I give my very life for you on the cross, I give you a parting gift that is most precious to me. I give you my mother. Behold your mother. Treasure her and you will have found a most precious treasure in your life. Yes, Mary is our mother of perpetual help. And seeing her example, she is our mother of perpetual hope. And that is why we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. May the faithful departed in the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. We now pray the fifth and the sixth stations. Jesus is helped. First, Simon of Cyrene helps him carry the cross. And then Veronica wipes the face of Jesus. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. I'd like to read to you from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 25, verses 37 to 40. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that you saw a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Death on the cross was the ultimate humiliation. And these oppressors wanted Jesus to go through it. They didn't want him to collapse before and therefore they grabbed Simon of Cyrene, who's on his way home from work, and they forced him to carry 
the cross of Jesus. Perhaps reluctantly he did so. And then comes Veronica of tradition. She was moved by the sight of Jesus' suffering and she courageously stepped forward to wipe the blood and sweat from the face of Jesus. It's a disfigured face with all those wounds. Yet perhaps you could say this is the only image or maybe only photograph that Jesus chose to leave with us. As we reflect on this, it is easy to look for God in the marvel and beauties of creation. But we can be quite blind to the ordinary, hurting, suffering brothers and sisters of us. We look for God in the miraculous. But God disappoints us. Most of the time, God reveals himself through the weaknesses of others. And as Jesus is walking the way of the cross, away from the screaming crowds, we see Simon the Cyrene and then Veronica. It was not easy for them when the crowd was hounding for the blood of Jesus. To those in the crowd, Jesus was just an ordinary man. More than that, he was now painted as a traitor and as a criminal. Simon did not know Jesus, but soon he realizes that it has been a grace to accompany Jesus and to help him with the cross. See the courage of Veronica. She steps forward alone, despite what the soldiers would have screamed at her or what the mobs would do to her. Today, we have the choice, the freedom to be Simon or Veronica. Or painfully, even the soldiers or the jeering mobs or guilty bystanders. Jesus identifies himself with those in need, the poor and the suffering. So we can choose to recognize him or we can choose to ignore him. Which is why when God came into the world, he made himself poor. He was born in a poor stable, a poor family, a poor village, a poor condition to leave us free terribly free to choose to choose him or to ignore him and we still have that freedom today i love to repeat that wonderful proverb if you want to become invisible then become poor because nobody will recognize you you do not count you do not matter and jesus reveals himself today in the poor and in the suffering you know, it's so enriching to be enveloped and embraced by Jesus in prayer in the chapel, in the church, and to recognize God's presence there. And that is wonderful. But this enriching presence is meant to open our eyes to his presence in the body, in the fellow human beings, in our homes and in the streets. We could spend extended time in prayer meetings and visuals which nourishes us immensely as it rightly should do. But we must also ask ourselves, would we also spend time in visual with an aged person or with a sick person? Would we give a break to the caregivers of such people and so that our prayer in visual, not only in the church, but in these broken situations will mean so much? Because if we do not do so, we have failed to understand what true prayer in the church really means. But there is reason for hope. I invite you to look back over your life and see who has been Simon and Veronica in your lives, who have reached out to you, helped you. Be grateful to them. People whom you could depend upon and lean on. They are large-hearted people who saw the world bigger than their own little lives and their own circle. Be thankful for them. Now look back over your own lives and count the many opportunities that you have received to reach out to various people and you have done so. You have made a difference in their lives just by being there for them. You have done good to them and you have done good for them. And you have resisted the temptation to brag or boast about it later. I did this for him, I did that for her. And we throw it into their face. You have resisted that temptation. We are called to be Simon. We are called to be Veronica in the world of today. Some might be quite content to stay within their comfort zone or the pleasure dome. Some might even say, and often do, leave me alone. Don't bother me. It's not my problem. But like Simon, Jesus calls us into unexpected situations. Are you willing to serve? If you are unwilling, overcome it and you will experience the joy of Simon. 
Like Veronica, God is calling you to attend to the suffering and the poor. Are you ashamed of the crowd and what will people say, afraid of ridicule? But when you do help, God will grant you an experience, an image of God in your life. God calls you to act, to serve and to see God's face in the poor and the suffering. Have you got the generosity of Simon? Have you got the courage of Veronica? In choosing to respond to them, you serve Jesus. God invites you to transform this way of the cross into a way of life, into the way of hope. And as you reach out to them, the master will say to you, Come, blessed of my father, enter the kingdom prepared for you. For as long as you did it to the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. And so we pray. Lord Jesus, your cry, I thirst, haunts me. It is loud and clear, for you wanted it to be heard and to re-echo down the ages. Lord, my heart beats, but it does not always throb with love. I have become so closed in and shut out the sufferings of others, so insensitive to their pain, unconcerned about their misery. Lord, it's a terrible to, thing to be blind, but to live in a world of darkness. It's worse to have eyes but to not see. Lord, it's a terrible thing to be deaf, to live in a world of silence. But it's worse to be numb, to lack sensation, and even worse to have sensation and not feel. Help me to be, not to become insensitive and indifferent in the plight of the people. Somewhere, somehow, Lord, I've got into a rut. I find myself closed into walls that imprison me and cut me off from others. I tell myself it's not my business. I comfort myself with the thought I cannot do anything about these problems. They are too vast, they are too complex for me. But then Lord, I am compelled to listen again and again to those words of yours. I was hungry and you did not give me to eat. I was thirsty and you did not give me to drink. Lord, help me. Share your thirst. Awaken me a restlessness, a hunger to serve those who are weak and broken. Help me not to seek you only in the church, but because of that, to seek you among the poor, broken and oppressed. Dear Jesus, I need a heart transplant. Change my heart. Give me a new heart. Give me a heart full of love. Help me to understand that the sign by which people will know that I am Christian, that I am yours, is through love and that whatever I do to the least of your brothers and sisters, I do unto you. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. And may the faithful departed in the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. The eighth station, Jesus meets the women of Jerusalem. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. I read to you from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 23, verses 27 and 28. A great number of the people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. The women of Jerusalem wept when they saw how Jesus suffered. And Jesus recognized their distress. And that's why he tells them, Do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and your children. Even in his agony, Jesus deeply feels the pain that will be theirs when Jerusalem is destroyed. Now, we reflect when we look at Jesus and look at these women at this station. Sickness and suffering generally reveal the character of a person in many if not all cases. The moment sickness comes upon some, they become obsessed about themselves and want others to wait on them hand and foot. On the other hand, we've met persons suffering from terminal diseases in such deep pain and yet are so other-centered, concerned about others rather than themselves. And this is what we see here in the person of Jesus. He suffered so much with the scourging, 
with the taunts, the cross, and yet he's concerned about these women, persons who did not count much in the culture of that time. At that time, when rabbis did not have women disciples, Jesus dared to accept them. In fact, in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, they accompanied and supported Jesus. Jesus was able to relate with women with such ease and such comfort. He gave them the dignity and the equality that comes from being created in the very image and likeness of God. It is no wonder that these women now of Jerusalem dared to walk beside him on the way of the cross while the rest of them were screaming and shouting at Jesus. What gives us reason to hope? Jesus had a special and courageous concern for the downtrodden. And in a special way, Jesus stood up for women. Look at Jesus and listen to his message for us today. Weep, we must. Weep for the children who are abused. Weep for the women who are victimized. Weep for the women who are trapped in abusive relationships and marriages. Weep for the women who bear the burden of family life when they are faced with irresponsible spouses. Weep for the women who fear for the safety outside their home and sometimes within their own home. Weep for the widows who are taken advantage of and shunned out of all functions. Weep for those men who keep women in bondage, either because of the way that they treat them or because they do not speak against such destructive practices in cultures and of our regions and of our time. Weep, weep, but do not just weep alone. Do something more than wipe the tears. Do something that is causing those tears. For these tears of pain, of hurt and of abuse are cries that go up to God. Men and women are not created to be in conflict or as competitors, but as companions and collaborators together. And this can best happen in an atmosphere of equality and dignity, which is revealed in the very book of Genesis, at the dawn of creation, when both male and female are created in the image and likeness of God. Women need to be given the rightful place in society, not as crumbs from the table, not as a favor granted to them, but because it is a right to this dignity. And it is our duty as men to recognize and acknowledge it. Let us pray. And here I now draw upon an adaptation of the Woman's Creed by Rachel Conrad Wahlberg. I believe in God who created woman and man in God's own image, who created the world and gave both sexes the care of the earth. I believe in Jesus, the child of God, the chosen of God, born of the woman Mary. This Jesus who listened to women and liked them, Jesus who stayed in their homes, who discussed the kingdom with them, who was followed and financed by women disciples. I believe in Jesus who discussed theology with the Samaritan woman at a well and first confided in her, his messiahship, who motivated her to go and tell her great news to the city, the first missionary in John's Gospel. I believe in Jesus who received anointing from a woman at Simon's house, who rebuked the men guests who scorned her, I believe in Jesus who said this woman will be remembered for what she did and that is minister to Jesus. I believe in Jesus who acted boldly to reject the blood taboo of ancient societies by healing the boldly bleeding woman who touched him. I believe in Jesus who healed a woman on the Sabbath and made her bent back straight because she was a human being. I believe in Jesus who spoke of God as a woman seeking the lost coin, as a woman who swept seeking the lost. I believe in Jesus who thought of pregnancy and birth with reverence, not as punishment. A metaphor for transformation, born again and transformed from anguish into joy. 
I believe in Jesus who appeared first to Mary Magdalene who sent her with a bursting message go and tell I believe in the wholeness of the savior in whom there is neither Jew nor Greek slave nor free male or female for we are all one in salvation Have mercy on us O Lord have mercy on us May the faithful departed in the mercy of God rest in peace Amen We now look at the 10th 11th and 12th stations on Calvary where Jesus is stripped of his garments nailed and finally dies on the cross We adore you O Christ and we bless you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world I read to you from the gospel according to Mark chapter 15 verses 22 to 25. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha which means the place of a skull and they offered him wine mixed with myrrh but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them casting lots to decide what each should take. It was 9 o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. After a long and painful journey during which Jesus stumbles and falls he finally arrives at Calvary the high point the place where he is going to be killed and murdered he is stripped totally of its clothes humiliated in front of everyone he is nailed these hands that once reached out now are nailed to the cross and then he dies at this last moments He joins the death depths of desperate humanity as he cries out Father why have you forsaken me He is actually quoting Psalm 22 but this seeming cry of despair ends in the psalm with a note of hope No wonder the Roman soldier a pagan says truly this man was the son of God And as the life of Jesus slowly ebbs away His words are not of condemnation or pity for himself but of forgiveness. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus utters those words, it is finished, and before Jesus can breathe his last, he cries out in a loud, loud voice, "Father, into your hands I commend my spirit." The death of Jesus like his birth reveals the consequences of God becoming human. For his death like his birth tells us that he fully embraced the human condition by embracing death on Calvary and on the cross Jesus was fully identifying with us His death can touch us on at least on two levels the first is the personal level No one can ever say does God know what it means to suffer God now knows it in Christ Jesus The second is not personal but structural Now when Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God a new structure his proclamation and its values brought the threat of death Jesus did not simply die for my sins he died because he defied the sinful structure of the world he called for the kingdom of God where there is equality and dignity forgiveness and mercy peace and justice and for doing that he paid the price He just did not simply die he was assassinated he was murdered He showed us that there is another way to live and for that he was killed because those people found it challenging upsetting and uncomfortable If you were on Calvary I'm sure you'd want to reach out to Jesus and you can do that because he says today I'm crucified in every person who suffers The pain of Calvary lingers even today. People are stripped even today of their dignity, their right to live of one square meal a day. Stripped because of prostitution and pornography. People are nailed today even as bonded workers, superstitious practices, forces that control and manipulate. People are killed even today because Calvary is today and Calvary is now and Calvary is here. For where there is suffering there is Calvary and that is holy ground because Christ suffers in that person. 
Calvary is no longer just a historical place. It is a situation. A situation of sin, of social sin, because of which people suffer. Yes, suffer and go through the same cycle as Jesus did on Calvary. Stripped, nailed and killed. Each character responsible for the drama on Calvary was either responsible or a victim of personal or social sin. Judas not only betrayed his master, but he also betrayed his greed for money because greed and materialism was a big value in society at that time, even more so now. The chief priests were not only jealous of the power and popularity of Jesus, they found him a threat and sought to eliminate eliminate him as it happens even today. Society has no room for those who challenge what is wrong and evil. They are captured and thrown into prison. Pilate knew Jesus was innocent, but he also knew that his prestige and popularity were at stake. So he ordered the crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus was not the only victim that day. Truth and justice were also killed, as they are killed even today. Calvary carries the burden of sin, personal sin and social sin. And so today, we are faced with a culture of death which opposes the culture of life. Politically, when the state does not protect the lives of citizens, then they are responsible for their deaths. Nationally, when institutions of the state or of democracy are weakened and threatened, this will tear the social fabric of the nation. Socially, when so-called superior groups or castes dominate the others, that is diabolic and death-dealing. Then there is the virus of communalism, hate speech, fake media that weaken the unity of the state or of the country. Money lenders who suck the blood of the poor by getting them in the grip of their claws with their loans. And then there is terrorism and fundamentalism which spread an even larger circle of violence until you want to shout out aloud, when will all this madness stop? Jesus Christ died on Calvary to free us from this madness and its burden of sin, personal and social sin, because that sin brings death. People are killed even today Calvary is today, Calvary is now, Calvary is here. And where there is pain and suffering, there is Calvary. That is holy ground because Jesus suffers and is crucified in that person. Let us pray. John 19.25 Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary the wife of Clophis and Mary Magdalene and you. Christ looks down at the foot of the cross. He's surrounded by mocking multitudes, jeering mobs, guilty bystanders. But there are also people who love him, his friends, his mother. Where would you place yourself? In silence, allow Jesus to speak to you. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. May the faithful departed in the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. We now look at the 13th and 14th stations. Jesus is taken down from the cross and placed in the tomb. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Read to you from the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 27 verses 57 to 60. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Joseph of Arimathea was rich not only in money, but also in courage and in faith. He dared to risk his status and his position and his wealth because he valued his faith in Jesus and so much more. And together with Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, 
tradition recalls also the presence of Mary. She who had wrapped him in swaddling clothes is now wrapping him in the shroud. They closed the tomb, Jesus is laid in the tomb and that night his body lay in the dark of the earth, a seed dying. Jesus is laid in the tomb but he's like John 12, 24, unless the grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it will not bear fruit. But this grain of wheat now is soon going to yield a rich harvest. The door of the tomb is closed. But is this really the end? Let us listen to something important so that we may hope. Between impossibility and possibility, there is a door, a door of hope. And the possibility of history's transformation lies through that door. The experience of the resurrection reveals this. The good news from the women at Jesus' tomb became for millions of people the greatest hope that the world has ever known. And yet, what did the male disciples call it? Nonsense. On one side of the door of the tomb, it is nonsense. On the other side of the door, it's the best news ever that Jesus' disciples heard. And the door in between is hope. Not everyone can see the door. And a number of people can imagine nothing on the other side of the door. Those who walk through the door must be prepared to suffer and to die. But history tells us again and again that when we move from one reality to another, we do so because we pay the price Blessed are those who dream dreams and are willing to pay the price to make them come true. And so visionaries are those who dare to hope, who have been the first to walk through the door. Because in order to walk through that door, first you must see it, then you have to believe that something lies on the other side. And that is what hope does to us. Hope is a refusal to allow ourselves to be drowned by the difficulties of the situation. We may not always be able to change the situation or another person's behavior, but we can choose to look differently at the situation and interpret reality in another way, and that can make a difference. And that is possible when we dare to hope. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? We were all there, every one of us, when we feared that there was no way forward, when that stone is not rolled. And Jesus is there whenever we feel entombed, hemmed in or in darkness. Let us pray. Faced with the silence of death, let us not despair but find hope. May the seeming finality of death not oppress us. Help us to trust in you, Lord, the Lord of the living and of the dead. And because you are the author of life, paradoxically, death is the final healing. For we realize that we, we who come from your hands will go back into your hands, into your peaceful embrace. And hence, we dare to hope. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. May the faithful departed in the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. We now come to our concluding reflection. Hope is the face of Jesus the Redeemer. His life, his death, is, and his resurrection is a promise. And what exactly is that promise? What will it bring about? The power that God showed in the resurrection of Jesus, the power to bring a dead body back to life, to redeem what seemed lost, to write straight with crooked lines, to bring people together despite and beyond their fears, their hatred, their selfishness, their mistake, their sinfulness. From the perspective of the Bible, hope is not simply a feeling or a mood. As the author Jim Wallace says, hope is the very dynamic of history. Hope is the engine of change. Hope is the energy of transformation. Hope is the door from one reality to another. Hope is believing the promise of God and believing that God has the power to fulfill that promise. And this is powerfully seen in the Luke chapter 24, the story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. They had put all their hopes in Jesus. And then when he was killed, those hopes came 
crumbling down. They were shattered. And this seeming stranger walks with them on the road. He allows them to tell their story without still revealing who he is. And they said, we had hoped. One of the saddest words you will find in the scriptures. They no longer had hope. But Jesus allowed them to expre express their hurt, their pain, their suffering, their own journey of the cross. He allowed them to do that. And after he allowed them to do that, that's when he gave the key of hope. He took their reality, reinterpreted and presented it in a way that they never seen before. And that's what hope does. These very disciples who were tired, exhausted, without hope, as they talked to this seeming stranger, enter the house because they said, let us now rest, it's too late. But once they experience the hope, see the transformation in their lives. Their feet get wings. Their life gets energy. There is hope in their hearts. And these men who are tired, exhausted, hopeless, you would say, now with hope, go running back all the way to Jerusalem because that is the power of hope. The way of the cross became for them a way of hope. And they said, were not our hearts burning? My dear sisters and brothers in Jesus, our Redeemer, we cannot deny the reality and the pain and suffering and the tragedy of the cross which we just seen in the life of Jesus and which we experience in our own lives. At the very start, I spoke of the film director who looked at the final scene so that we will interpret that life. And that's what we have done. We have looked at the tragedy of Good Friday through the promise and the hope of Easter Sunday. Suffering and death do not have the last word. Rather, the tomb for Jesus was only seemingly a tunnel. The last word belongs to Jesus, for he is the hope-giving and the life-giving word. And may we who bear our own crosses also experience the power of his cross and the power of his hope in our lives. The way of the cross is truly for all of us the way of hope. We now pray for the intentions of the Holy Father. Our Father, who art, who art in, heaven, in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be, be thy, thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, be done on, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive, forgive those who trespass, trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver, deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And so, finally, the final blessing, and may the blessing of God Almighty and the power of the cross be with you as we bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us live in the hope and in the strength of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will conclude with the final hymn, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. God sent His Son.